Well, hello, friends. Welcome to the Serenity OS update for March 2023. It's been another cool month in the project, uh, coming in at just under 1,200 commits, I think. And we got all kinds of nice little things to look at today. And Linus is here as well. Um, he's going to talk about browser stuff. But first, as usual, let's take a look at the desktop. So here we are on the March edition of the Serenity OS desktop. And the first thing I want to talk about is decompression. So um, Tim and Tim, Tim Schumacher and Tim Flynn have both worked on decompression this month. And uh, Tim Schumacher worked on adding support for LZMA and XZ uh, compression formats. So we now have uh, utilities for decompressing these. So I can use LZCAT if I just want to see what's in one of these things. And I also have XZCAD for XZ files and um, very exciting. <laughs> um, so uh, Tim Schumacher implemented both of these. Uh, amazing work, really, really cool. And it's part of his greater project to build Serenity on Serenity. And we needed to be able to decompress these as part of our build system. So he just went and implemented decompression for them. Um, amazing, actually. <laughs> That's really cool. So thank you, Tim, for working on that. Uh, the other Tim, Tim Flynn, worked on um, com decompression performance. So uh, we used to take, I think, over 30 seconds to decompress. There's this benchmark uh, file that is used for decompression benchmarking. Uh, and I think it used to take 30 plus seconds, maybe 35 or something like that. And uh, now, if we just cat it to dev null, um, it is cold. So we're reading from the file system uh, or reading from the disk. But um, actually, let's time that. So when it is cached, it should be pretty fast. Uh, 3.5 seconds, apparently. It's it's actually a lot faster when I'm not recording at the same time, um, closer to one second. So that's kind of interesting. Um, actually, let me see if that is at all related to um, to using gzip instead of gunzip. I should have timed that. Oh, how very interesting. So <laughs> gunzip has uh, some optimization probably that gzip doesn't. So we need to bring that optimization to gzip as well when used in decompression mode. Anyways, uh, shout outs to Tim Flynn for improving that. And um, that is been, it's been really amazing, honestly, because the deflate decompression algorithm that you see being decompressed here is used in many formats, including PNGs. And all of the system icons and my wallpaper here with the cute panda, it's all PNGs. So when we boot up, uh, we are now like many, many times faster at loading these images. So loading the wallpaper in particular used to be something that could take several seconds, uh, <laughs> which is pretty bad. And Tim has just made all that go away by making it incredibly fast instead. So super awesome. Um, oh, by the way, before I forget, um, Quiva went and also added this interesting uh, thing to file manager. If you double click on a zip file, it now extracts it into a temporary directory. So you can um, you can get to the files directly in the file manager. And I think this only works for zip files at the moment, but it is it is an interesting development. So um, it's always nice to see new people working on the system. So welcome, Quiba. Um, OK, speaking of new things, there is a new tool this month called Image. And Image was added by Nico. And my understanding is that it's kind of an image manipulation tool, kind of, or encoder tool, maybe. So what you can do with it now that I'm aware of is that you can use it to generate, um, let's say, Panda BMP from um, my panda PNG wallpaper, for example. So um, it just loads an image and then writes it out. And I think the idea is that uh, we're going to add more command line options that allow you to manipulate the image in various ways. So I think I can generate a BMP, probably a QOI, and I don't know what other formats we support, actually. Maybe PNG also. <laughs> 
Wow, that takes a hot minute to do a PNG, actually. Um, yeah, and then, as you can see, we have three versions of this. The PNG is the best compressed one. Uh, and, oh man, this, I, I haven't enjoyed this for, uh, for a moment, and just double-clicking on the files in the terminal, um, it's so awesome. And I know we had it forever, but like, when I haven't done it for a while, and then I go and double-click on a file, it feels so cool. <laughs> So I double click on these and open them in uh, Image Viewer here, as you can see. And uh, we did see some new stuff in Image Viewer this month. Uh, Lucas went and improved it so that um, when we launch Image Viewer, like I just did, uh, it will scale the window to an appropriate size instead of like if you load a huge image, it would um, it would sometimes just make the window bigger than the screen even. So now it just um, makes it like a kind of an appropriate size. Um, and it also follows like this. I think unless you start manipulating the zoom level. Oh, no, 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 then it's still followed. Okay. <laughs> My misunderstanding. Uh, and if you rotate, let's see how you do that like this. Yeah, then it doesn't um, scale or shift the window around which it used to do, which was really annoying. So um, it just feels a lot nicer to use actually now. It, it used to have this irritating behaviors where if you would, um, especially when you would rotate and the window would change size, that was really weird. So thank you, Lucas, for, for making Image Viewer a bit better. Uh, all right, so um, other random things. Uh, I wanted to, oh, I know where we should go. Let's go to Hack Studio. So I actually have a checkout here of Yucked, and I'm going to open that in Hack Studio. Uh, hopefully. All right, here we go. So new this month is CMake syntax highlighting. This was implemented by Sam, who decided one day that we need CMake syntax highlighting. So shout outs to Sam for coming up with that. It is really nice, the fact that CMake files are now syntax highlighted. Uh, and since this is actually a, a Git repo, or excuse me, this is a Git repo here. So if I open up some file, or actually I have a file open, I can just make an edit here. You'll see uh, it actually gets a Git modification marker because now I have a local modification to this file. And this is another thing Sam worked on this month. So these uh, little markers here in the uh, margin of the text editor next to the line numbers. Um, I forget what we call them. I think gutter indicators. Um, they used to be implemented in a very bespoke way for Hack Studio. And uh, as it turns out, they might be useful in other programs that use text editors. So Sam built a more generalized API for adding gutter indicators and uh, ported all of our use of, of different indicators to this API. So here you can see I have both a breakpoint and a git indicator, for example, uh, showing at the same time, which is uh, nice. Uh, anyway, I think that was the stuff I wanted to show you in Hack Studio, actually, yeah. Um, OK, let me show you something I did. So. Uh, I worked a bit on font support this month, and something I'm pretty happy with is that we can now load um, emoji fonts. And uh, this is the Noto color emoji font. I think it's from Google. And just to show you here, I will insert a uh, bison maybe and a heart. Let's see, maybe that one. Yes, very cool. Uh, so. <laughs> This is, um, yeah, we're basically loading a, a, a true type or open type font that has embedded bitmaps. And then we know how to display these now. And what you're seeing here on the right is just an HTML preview. So I'm using that to, to render them. Uh, I don't, we can't use them uh, in the system text editors yet, but they do show up in uh, web content. So. Um, that is just to showcase the fact that, that we can load these fonts at all. And I'm pretty happy with that. Um, all right. Let's go and look at uh, Pixel Paint. I think we had something new there. 
Um, as I recall, we had duplicate layer this month. So let's say hypothetically that I make a layer and I draw a um, an eye on it, I guess. <laughs> and let's say that, you know, I wanted to be anatomically correct. So I want to have two eyes. So let me then duplicate that layer and boom, two eyes. And of course, that would not be complete without a um, mouth of, of some some description. So uh, good enough. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me save that as um, handsome. Handsome.pp. <laughs> um, so we also added a, um, a duplicate Duplicate layer was added by Tim Ledbetter, who also, I was going to say, added the recently opened files menu, which is currently failing to show the handsome entry. So that's a little bit surprising. Um, I would have expected saving the file to make it show up there, but maybe it only shows up once I open it once. Yeah, now it's there. Okay, so it just maybe it just needs a little tweaking to have consistent behavior with other applications. But Regardless, it is really nice to start to see these uh, recently open files lists make their way into our various document centric applications. Uh, I think it's a it's a lovely feature to have. And uh, did I mention that this was also done by Tim Ledbetter? I don't remember if I did, but Tim Ledbetter, big ups for working on Pixel Paint. Um, okay, let's look at something a little bit silly. <laughs> so. Uh, I know that the snake game this month has seen um, some some amazing new development because people decided that we need to have bitmap based skins. So you can now get a San Francisco garter snake, for example. Uh, can I resize that to zoom it in? Isn't that beautiful? Um, so you can actually choose between Sri Lankan green vine, eastern coral snake, <laughs> a blue Malaysian coral snake. A ladybird, apparently. Just a green snake or the classic. Uh, I don't love the classic one. <laughs> I just implemented it quickly. So it is nice. This is actually something like I wish I would have done when originally making the snake game. And the fact that somebody went and made it bitmappy warms my heart, I gotta say, because finally Snake is starting to get closer to the original vision I had, but uh, forgot to <laughs> pursue. Uh, so Bitmap Snakes was implemented by uh, Haw Development and uh, then didn't quite finish it. And then Sam picked it up and finished it. And I think Hecha also added a bunch of um, possibly anatomically correct uh, real life snakes. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know how to authenticate that. But uh, anyways, thank you everybody who contributed to bitmap snake skins. That is pretty sweet. Um, all right. So, oh, speaking of Tim Ledbetter, by the way, I think he also added uh, reverse sort. Um, I think that was this month. Reverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you had a file that contained one, two, and three, and then I wanted to see that in reverse sort order, I could use sort dash R, thanks to Tim Ledbetter. Very cool, very cool. Sort dash R actually is a mainstay in my um, random like shell programming pipelines that I end up making. So um, I appreciate this, that, that Tim added this because I would eventually have tried to use it and discover that it wasn't there. And now that will not happen. <laughs> Anyways, the um, final thing I want to show you here in the desktop is the uh, terminal settings applications or ter the terminal settings window. So this is something I worked on this month, just um, sprucing up the, the, the dialog layout here and reorganizing it so that you have all of the settings sort of ordered by uh, likelihood that you would want to change them. So at least in my view, um, I usually want to tweak the font I'm using, maybe tweak the background opacity, and then less interesting, but still possibly interesting visual stuff like 
shape of the cursor, does it blink, how much scroll back do I have, that's kind of relevant. And then less interesting things like um, bell modes and exit behavior, um, or like more niche things, I guess. Because, yeah, so basically I organized it so it's visual stuff and behavior stuff separately. And just, uh, you know, niced up all the padding and margins and stuff so that they were consistent. And I, I think it looks pretty nice now. Could probably be better, but incremental improvement is where it's at. All right. So uh, now we are going to visit Linus, who's going to talk about the browser and everything around that. All right. Let's talk about the uh, JS engine changes first. Um, we were a little bit lazy and didn't do any user-facing stuff, so um, I just made a few notes, uh, nothing to demo today. Uh, Andreas added a nice uh, fast path to some number conversion, so we have a optimization where instead of storing a double, as all um, ECMAScript numbers usually are, we can also store a signed integer. And if that's uh, already in a value, then we don't have to um, first convert it to a double and then back to an integer. And that shaved off like, I don't know, 6% of some benchmark. So that's pretty good. Um, that was nice to see. Uh, Leon worked on some more bytecode fixes as in the month before. Uh, Luke added a new format to uh, date.parse. So um, every time we find a website in the wild, that um, passes a string of a previously unknown format to date.pass. We have to basically support that because there's no not really a way around it. And um, so we now have an ever-growing list of different non-standard formats that are supported. Uh, of course, we did more work on the um, OOM uh, handling of OOM errors and a conversion to the new string. Um, so Tim did a bunch of work on that. Then. Uh, Matthew worked on some very interesting tooling um, that doesn't actually run in the engine, but sort of statically analyzes uh, use of garbage collected um, pointers, so like memory that lives on the JS heap, uh, and making sure that all of these are wrapped in like the right um, uh, pointer types, like we have a GC pointer and a non-null GC pointer, and those should obviously only point to stuff that actually lives on the JS heap. And ideally, nothing lives in a raw pointer uh, for the JS heap so that we can uh, keep track of all those. Uh, so very interesting developments there. Um, and then I made a small improvement to the uh, return type that we use that wraps either a value or an exception, um, which previously would allocate memory for both. Um, and now it sort of puts that into a, a union, if you will, um, and only allocates the amount needed to store um, the bigger one of them. Uh, and then Tim did the same for exceptional, which is the same thing basically in libweb. Uh, that's it for libjs. Uh, hopefully we have some more exciting stuff to show next month. Um, but let's actually look at the browser now. So we have some UI changes. Uh, first of all, around zooming. So a feature we had for a few months now. Uh, you can control plus and control minus um, in and out. Uh, it's pretty laggy right now. I don't know why. Uh, probably because I have two GitHubs open and the CPU is spinning. Uh, anyway, so you might have noticed um, once I do that, uh, we pop up a little um, percentage here, which is actually a button that resets the zoom level. Um, and that you have probably seen in Oh God, <laughs> uh, you have probably seen in other browsers before. I don't know what happened to the page, but essentially the idea is that we now um, tell you what the current zoom value is, whereas previously you could just increase or decrease it and reset it, um, but it wouldn't actually tell you what zoom level you're at. Uh, let's see if I can fix this somehow. Uh, nope, it's not coming back. Oh, well, it says crash, so this one is that. Uh, but yeah, so now in the um, view menu, uh, we also show you the zoom level. Can even zoom in and out on the crash page. Isn't that lovely? Uh, so yeah, thank you for, for that uh, Mac view. That is uh, very helpful. I really like it. Uh, next up, 
let's see, um, we have a new menu in the debug entry here. So um, we have all these dump uh, entries that you will basically never need if you don't actually develop the browser. And if you do develop the browser, you might already know them, um, but I'll mention it for completeness anyway. Uh, so new this month is dumping the paint tree. So we can al already dump the DOM tree, the layer tree, the stacking context tree. They all sort of interact with each other, but are all different. And so it's good to have individual um, methods to sort of show them uh, in the console. Uh, so I can't actually put that on screen right now because it's on a window on my host machine, but it will print out a, a colorful tree uh, and it's very nice. Um, and then let's see what else. Uh, right, we have a few improvements to the bookmark button here. Uh, let's maybe, oh no, uh, the system is not very happy today. Let's see if we can reload that. Um, let's see, so uh, if you try to bookmark this page, it will now ask you um, for a title and a URL. Um, ignore this rendering issue here, that's because we don't use the default font right now. Uh, versus previously, it would default assign a title and then you had to edit the bookmark to change the title. So now you can do that up front. And even if you misclick the button for some reason, you can cancel it and it will not bookmark it. And that was added by Kimal, so thank you for that. Uh, then on the web driver front, some updates. Uh, we're still not running um, the entire web platform test shed just yet. But uh, Alexander and Tim have done a lot of work in the last month uh, just to get us closer to that milestone. Um, so one thing I really liked uh, because it's been bothering me a lot before is that we now wait for navigations to complete. So previously you had to either insert a sleep or like pause into the script that ran the web driver commands uh, or you just had to pray that um, the page would complete uh, its navigation before the next command would uh, be executed. And so that is now done properly. Uh, we have much better support for opening new windows. So um, that when I first uh, started working on getting web platform tests running, I had like a, a one working test, but that only ran in a single window. But if you want to run the entire thing, then it wants to open like sub windows. And so Alexander, added a lot of new infrastructure for that. Um, and it's still not, I think, 100% supported, but um, it's a lot closer now. And, you know, a lot of um, architectural changes like that. Uh, so thanks to Alexander and Tim for doing that. And then on the actual engine itself, uh, you can already see this page. Um, it's a canvas demo of the canvas element. And Andreas added, um, Canvas rendering context 2D dot uh, image smoothing enabled. So a Boolean property that you can turn off on and off, basically. Uh, I stole this wonderful demo from MDN. So thanks to them for providing that. And it shows uh, we have an image at the uh, source scale here, and then we can upscale it. And depending on the smoothing option, it either you know looks like this, or you just see the pixelated version. And that's supposed to say smoothing equals false on not the back. Uh, so yeah, that's very cool. And I think that was added for Ruffle specifically, which is a Flash player emulator uh, that runs in the browser, uh, doesn't need Flash, uh, which is good. Uh, this is for later. Uh, Andreas also worked on a ton of other stuff as usual. Um, so uh, more work on layout optimization, making pages layout faster. Um, there was a really cool video about that where he optimized the Discord uh, friend list. If you haven't seen that, uh, definitely check it out. Um, and uh, he's worked on Flexbox. I'm pretty sure I've seen um, improvements to float layouts, uh, all kinds of stuff. And just generally hacking away at various websites. So for example, here's a screenshot where he logged into the old Gmail. Um, you know, it doesn't look perfect, but uh, you could read some emails in there. Um, also, we now uh, can run the Kraken JavaScript benchmark test uh, from Mozilla. Um, it's very slow still, but uh, we can run it. So we could start looking at improving those results. 
Uh, so that's very exciting. Um, what else? So this page reloaded after crashing. Uh, yes, I early in the month uh, converted the window object uh, to IDL, um, which is interface definition language. It's something they invented for uh, the web specs specifically to sort of uh, specify JavaScript APIs in a um, manner that is not really tied to uh, the implementation language. So instead of saying like, uh, do this in C++, they just give you IDL and then you can generate um, your own code from that, which is what we do. And as you can see, generating code shaved off a bunch of um, lines here. Uh, and generally deduplicated some stuff, uh, made it easier to add new stuff to it, um, made it easier to uh, ensure that legacy properties have the correct behavior and stuff like that. Um, so this has been ongoing for a while and is finally matched, which I'm very, very happy about. Uh, then let's see, Luke has also been doing a very big refactor, which is uh, getting XHR, uh, which is now hidden behind this popper, uh, to use fetch. So um, fetch is not just public JS API, it's also a lot of underlying infra. And uh, a lot of stuff is spec to use that. So XHR, for example, um, actually just defers to fetch infra. And so now we do that as well. And that fixed a whole bunch of stuff, like um, as you can read here, we now correctly send various headers. Uh, we can do course preflight requests, um, filtering, not handing out certain headers to uh, requests from other origins, all sorts of stuff. So this was a great improvement. Uh, thanks to Luke for doing that. Um, also in the refactor uh, that I did for the window, I added some new properties. So for example, we now have window that is secure context, uh, which is why I loaded a HTTP and an HTTPS version of the Serenity TOS website. And if we open that in a console, uh, this didn't magically appear, I typed this early. Uh, so the HTTPS one is a secure context, which makes sense. And the plain HTTP one is not a secure context, which also makes sense. Uh, so scripts that rely on this uh, property can now work more correctly. Uh, that's that. Then Tim did some work on um, input handling. So if I do left and right, um, usually if you have characters like uh, A, B, and C, um, you know, that's one um, byte and then we just delete that and the character disappears. But what happens if you have emojis, which are not always, but um, commonly multiple code points, um, no, multiple bytes per um, emoji. So like um, this will be a combination of five different um, bytes, for example. So if you delete one of them, the emoji sort of gets ripped apart and turns into something else or just displaced garbage. So what we really want to do is uh, navigating the arrow left or right needs to uh, respect the graphene cluster and then skip like four bytes, for example. And Tim updated it to do that. So if you have emojis in an input somewhere, we can now correctly delete those, for example. Uh, so that's awesome. Uh, and generally you see that trend across the entire system where we now have better handling for things like this, where we would previously assume that one visible character just is one single byte in the underlying data. Um, let's see, uh, also, since I mentioned Luke's uh, XHR refactor, uh, Srikovin did the same, but for style sheets. So those also load via fetch now, uh, which also has implications for how exactly the requests get sent and stuff like that. Um, then, uh, Kenneth worked on form data iterator. Don't have a demo right now, but um, I already demoed form data in the previous month, I think. So uh, he just continued work on that. Uh, something really exciting uh, is we have much improved support for checkbox rendering now. So after I did a um, small improvement to the 
checkboxes. Mac due did a massive improvement to the checkboxes. So they actually scale properly now. Um, it's not SVGs, but it's very similar. Um, so you can just go in and out as you want here. And it just looks nice at every zoom level, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and then more things that you might have noticed is we now support this um, middle state. Where I think it's called indeterminate, um, where the checkbox is neither checked nor unchecked, um, which is not really that intuitive. And I don't think you see it in the wild that often, um, but that was also added by Srikovin. Um, can only set that via JS, I believe. So it's not even supported in HTML. Um, but yeah, supported for all these checkboxes now. And also we now support the um, accent color CSS property, uh, also added by MacDew. So we use this to apply the default color um, from the user agent um, theme, uh, but you can also override it and then you can customize the color without supplying a complete restyle of the checkbox. Like obviously you can apply your own CSS, but if you just want the color to fit into your website a little bit, a little bit more nicely, then you can just set the accent color property. And the same also works for radio buttons. Um, different scales and different colors and scaling very nicely. Uh, so this is really cool. Uh, what's the next one? Scope, right. Uh, let's see. We need, nope. We need the source for this. So uh, there's something called the scope CSS pseudo class. Um, it's not really useful in like a regular style sheet, but it's very useful in um, query selector role. So uh, let's open the console actually, which is empty. Okay, well, that's not working. Uh, but so what's supposed to happen here is that uh, we have a diff in the page. Uh, in the diff is another diff. And then we take the body and uh, on that element we query, give us diff. And that selects the outer one and the inner one. So this one will return two. But what if on that specific element we just want all adjacent diffs, so like immediate um, children. Um, now we can't omit this because that's not valid CSS. Like you can just put the um, opening bracket here and then say, give me the diff, um, can't do that. And if we completely omit that, we get all the diffs. But using scope, we can now sort of select the element here and then it takes that and uh, only uses the immediate children and that would only give us the outer diff. Uh, so this can be useful at times and was added by Simon. So thank you for that. And Simon also worked on another UI feature in the browser. Um, yeah, this one. Uh, so a simple page that says hello world here. Let's take a look at the source. And it's a shadow DOM. So we take the body, we attach a shadow root, uh, mode open means we can um, we get the shadow root returned and we can write into it. And um, so one thing I noticed during uh, when making this demo, they are actually rendered in reverse. I'm not sure if this is correct. So it says world and then I had to put hello here. So it says hello world. Uh, that's probably a bug, but if we look at the DOM tree, which is what I'm really about here, and we open those notes, you can see we have world here, which is a uh, simple text. We have the script and we have a shadow root. And I believe in the last video or in the month before that, I complained that uh, this is not, well not complained, but noted that this is not visible here. So they would just disappear even though they were in the DOM tree. And now we show them. And it even says uh, which mode it is. And we can look inside and select the elements here. Uh, so this is an awesome improvement to the DOM tree uh, done by Simon. Thank you for that. And then lastly, we have a new API. 
which look at it for one of the many websites they were testing, probably YouTube. I don't exactly remember that. But if we open this one. Also, many thanks to whoever added the recent files feature. I think it was Andreas. It's very useful. Uh, much faster than opening the file explorer. So if we put some stuff, let's reload the page here. And the console disappeared. So uh, we have a few new APIs. So performance is an instance of the performance object that's always created on the global object by default. And we can get entries. There's nothing in there. Uh, we can create a new entry, uh, a so-called performance mark. We give it a name, uh, a create set, adds it to some global state. Uh, we do that. Where the hell did the console go? Something is wrong with that window. Uh, we do it again and do it again. Different names here. And then we ask it again to give us the entries. And this time we get a list back with all the performance marks that we added so far. So we don't need to keep track of them ourselves. Uh, for starters, uh, the browser can also add some automatically. So like for resource loading, um, it will, would automatically, it's not supported yet. But for example, when a style sheet finished loading, and then you can query that. Um, and we can also convert it to JSON, which is um, done automatically. Don't need to uh, reinvent the wheel here. And then it tells us the name, um, what type it is, at which time this occurred, uh, all that stuff. So we get all these entries here. And then you could send that to some analytics server that then uh, makes a nice graph out of it. And you can also filter by name. So if you just want the full entries, uh, that works as well. And now the string is shorter. Uh, so yeah, this was, as I mentioned, used on some live website uh, and they were missing that. And now we have it. So thanks to Luke for that. Uh, this one can go probably. And then lastly, I have a, I had a small announcement, but the browser, browser crashed. Uh, so I started a blog series called This Week in Ladybird, um, where I basically go through all the changes that are in some way related to uh, the Ladybird browser project, so the web engine, the JavaScript engine, WebAssembly, all that stuff, um, and go into a little bit more detail and also mention stuff that doesn't make it into these videos because it's either too technical or too boring. Um, so if you want sort of a chronological change log every single week, um, every Sunday I compile a little list and write some notes. Um, it's on my blog. Uh, we'll put a link in the description. Um, you can subscribe to the Atom feed or uh, follow me on Mastodon or things like that to stay up to date. And I hope you enjoyed. And with that, we don't need to wait for the <laughs> ref reporter here to finish. And I'll pass back to Andreas. And that's all the things that we had to show you here today. Thank you so much for stopping by and keeping up to date with the project. If you want to come chat with uh, developers, you'll find most of us on the Discord server. There's a link in the video description. And if you want to sponsor development of Serenity OS, you'll find links for that in the description as well. Uh, I'm personally working on this full time since May of 2021, thanks to the generous support of so many of you. So thank you all so very much for helping me continue to do this. It is amazing. Uh, all right. That's it for today. Uh, see you all next time. Bye.